today is known as Palm Sunday. So I'm reading from Mark chapter 11, verse number 1. It says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead, go into that village over there. He told them, as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, what are you doing, just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. So the two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. And they brought it out to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. And many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession. Other versions say there were those that went before and those that came after. Jesus was the centerpiece of the procession. And the people all around him were shouting. All around Jesus, there were voices of shouts that said, praise God. Other versions say Hosanna, same thing. Praise God, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. Uh, before I go forward, let's just go ahead and read the other scriptures I had. Mark chapter 8, I believe. Mark chapter 8. Verse number 27, right? 31, that'll be better. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Do you get that picture? I love Peter. He's the hardest-headed man I know. And God still used him. He reprimands Jesus for saying such things. Jesus turned around, looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter right back. Get away from me, Satan. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And then one last passage in Matthew. Where did I do it? 47, 26, 47. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. And so Judas, Judas comes straight to Jesus Greetings, Rabbi. He exclaimed and gave him a kiss. And Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. My friend. To the one that he gave the keys to the kingdom, he called him a devil. But the, the one that was a traitor to him, he said, my friend. And on this Palm Sunday, I would like to minister this topic with the help of the Lord. Reality does not equal truth. Reality does not equal truth. I, I want to make a statement today, and, and I hope it gets locked into your spirit. 
perception is reality. <laughs> perception is reality, but reality is not truth. Truth supersedes reality. Truth goes beyond reality. Reality is a set amount of figures or data that our brains perceive to be reality. Now, don't get me wrong. Our perceptions may not be wrong. If you are sick today, you might be sick today. That's not wrong. It's just not true. Because when truth intersects with your sickness, all of a sudden the truth will set you free. The truth will bring healing. The truth will bring courage. You see, there is no such thing as a sickness that's unto death. I've got some of you looking at me like, Pastor, what rock did you crawl out from under? Because if you live in Christ... Even if this body dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. My friend, we get so wrapped up in the data and the minutia of our lives that it gives us a perception of our reality. But our reality is not based on truth. I've often wondered why Jesus even rode the colt into Jerusalem. Have you ever thought that? He knew that he was going to the cross a week later. He'd been talking to the disciples even before Palm Sunday to the point where Peter was so assumptive that he stepped up and said, hey, Jesus, we've got to talk. Um, uh, I think you've got the wrong T's crossed, the wrong I's dotted. I don't think you've gone into the law of Moses enough, figured out exactly what kind of a Messiah that this nation needs. I don't think that you have figured out yet exactly what it means to be a Messiah. You haven't figured out what it means to be a Christ. You have, I, I, I'm reading between the lines, but the Bible says it does reprimand him for saying these things. I don't know what else Peter tried to tell Jesus, but Jesus looked back and rebuked him and said, get away from me, Satan. For you're looking at things through uh, the human point of view and not God's. You see, Palm Sunday, for God that knows the end from the beginning, Palm Sunday was the closure of a prophetic terminology in the book of uh, Daniel that closes out what we would classify as the 69th of the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy and is ushering in the transition of a church age. The only reason he did the Palm Sunday coronation was so that he could close out one era and open up another. And here's, they're, all, they're all coming. Now, we criticize the Jews in Scripture. But I just got to tell you, I fear that most of us will be right along with them. Uh, notice the chronology here. Jesus talks to the disciples. Peter rebukes them. Judas is there. Judas is there as the Palm Sunday is happening. How do I know that? Because the Last Supper hasn't happened yet. And he was at the Last Supper. And it was at the Last Supper that Jesus told Judas, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. So Judas himself is throwing down his coat, throwing down the palm branches. Hosanna! Blessed is he that, in fact, I believe, this is just Tim Sanders' theology, I believe that Palm Sunday is the last straw in Judas' argument that Jesus wasn't really who he said he was. Because you have to understand from the time of Alexander the Great, about 400 and some odd years before Christ, 
all the way really through till 400 AD, there was something that was happening within the culture. It's called the Hellenization of the culture. It was turning everything about the culture into Greek philosophy. And so what we have happening at the time of Christ is this argument about blending the concept of Judaism with the concept of Greek mythology. And there's a battle that's going on, and it doesn't play out until even after Christ is gone. But that's why... That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so much against Christ because Christ was something ushering something in that didn't line with the Hellenistic thought processes. And so Rome didn't like them. Think of that. Rome didn't like them. The Greeks didn't really like them. The Jews didn't like them. And the Christians weren't sure. And yet he's coming riding in on a donkey. And all of these people, the crowds, encompassed him. Hosanna. But can I show you where they went wrong? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who establishes the king of our ancestor David forever. Paul mentioned it in Sunday school. They they missed it. I, I don't know that they missed it. They just didn't perceive it. The perception of their reality was that here comes Jesus. And they're expecting Jesus to come into Jerusalem, the hub of all Judaism and Roman thought in the area of Judea. And Jesus is coming and getting ready to raise up a revolt against that which is against them. And all the time in the history that people have had their thumbs on the Israelite people are getting ready to be over because their Messiah is stepping onto the scene. Can I tell you why people so quickly went from saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes into the name of the Lord, into being the people that were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, in just a matter of days. It's because they were dwelling in the reality that they perceived. You see, their perception of a Messiah was a mighty warrior. Their perception of the Messiah was going to be the one that raised up the kingdom of Israel to rule and reign once again from the throne of David. And and let me just give you a little secret. You Thursday attenders, you've heard this. But even the disciples that spent three and a half years 24-7 with Jesus still didn't get it in Acts chapter 1. They're sitting with him. Well, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus, I would pound my head against a brick. Open up your understanding. Get beyond what you perceive to be right. Because you're dwelling in a reality that is not coming into existence yet. And you're missing out the truth that is. Because the Bible says that through Christ came grace and truth. And their perception was law and reigning. And their perception attached itself to this reality that Israel was going to become great like it was in the days of David. And that was their reality. But the truth was... No, I'm just riding on a donkey to set a timetable in this thing called time. There's, I have, unless somebody else has some other reason, I have no other reason why Jesus drove into Jerusalem on a colt other than to usher in the end of one week and the start of another in Daniel's prophecy. So three or four days later, those same people that praised him began to call for crucifixion because they perceived And the reality was, he's a false prophet because he ain't done what we thought he was going to do. You know, I think some of them even got excited because it was after the entry to Jerusalem that Jesus went in and cleansed the temple. 
And I have this sneaky feeling that the people that worshiped him on Palm Sunday were the ones that saw him clean the temple. And in the back of their minds, they don't perceive the reality of the kingdom because Jesus is confronting the religious order and not the political order. He's fighting against that which was tradition instead of that which was oppressive. See, Jesus was not there to set them free from Roman oppression. He was sent, he was sent there at that moment to set them free from the shackles of sin that have taken hold of them and to release them. There is coming a day at the end of the great tribulation where Jesus will come riding in, not on a donkey, but on a white horse, and he'll take control, and he will set up Israel's kingdom. But they didn't perceive that at the time. And I believe that some of us are walking our lives, and we're perceiving things that seem to be reality when really it's not reality. How many people here have the thought or the perception that this world is falling apart? It's a pretty good reality. It's not true. If it was true, that means God's not in control. I don't mean to mess with your thought process. It's, it, it's very real. The mess that's in this world today is very real, but it's not true. Jesus is allowing some of this junk to happen so that the gold that's pure can rise to the top so that we can become purified and become righteous in his sight so that when his trumpet sounds we will not only have gold rise to the top but we will walk on streets of gold that's the truth see here's the problem we don't recognize how Jesus deals with us I read here today in your hearing that when Peter began to reprimand him for the things that Jesus was saying, he said, get behind me, Satan. Good friend you are. When was the last time you looked at your closest friend, called them Satan? Rebuked them. See how well they take it. Because Peter could not understand why the Messiah should suffer. He did not understand why the Messiah should have to go through the things that he was getting ready to go through. He did not understand or perceive the truth. The reality to him was Jesus is our Messiah, the Son of the living God. His perception and his reality was that Jesus was the one that whispered to the storm, peace be still, and everything got quiet. His perception was that Jesus was the one that spoke to the blind man and the deaf man and the dead man and the woman with the issue of blood, and they were healed. That was the perception. He's, so why should somebody that does all of that good stuff have to suffer? And Peter wasn't perceiving it because he was looking from a human point of view and not God's point of view. Has anybody ever wondered what it is that makes a human point of view a human point of view? Well, let me suggest to you today it's this. We think in terms of fairness. Well, that ain't fair. I mean, you think about it. In the sports world this week, on one of the radio stations, the guy spent an hour talking about the officiating against the Timberwolves. Well, they didn't call it this way. They didn't call it. Since when is life supposed to be fair? Show me scripture that says life is supposed to equal out, that one's not supposed to suffer more than the other. Show me in Scripture anywhere that none of us should suffer. 
that any of us should have not have to deal with things. There's nowhere in Scripture that says it, but our perceived reality is if I'm a believer, I shouldn't have to deal with such and so. Uh, am I walking into somebody's living room? I, I, I know I've sat this week as I thought about this the last couple of days. We perceive things. And it becomes our reality. And so our reality says, well, they've got it better than I've got it. And more importantly, they don't deserve better than I do. They've got a better job than I've got. And yet I'm serving God and they're not. They've got this. They're doing this. God is blessing this and he's not blessing me. And, 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 and I see him on Wednesday when he's being a jerk. And I'm never a jerk. Perception is your reality. And so it gets into us that says, I'm right, they're wrong. Because I'm right and they're wrong, that means God must be wrong. And here's the words that Jesus will use to you like he did to Simon Peter. Get behind me, Satan. It's not fair. Simon Peter, one of the first disciples, was with Jesus everywhere, went with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. He was one of the big three. Peter, James, and John. Everywhere Jesus went, Peter went. Peter was the spokesman. Peter was the one that had a big enough mouth that said, Thou art the Son of God. And Jesus said, he aptly named him. You're no longer named Simon, you're named Peter, because upon this rock, the first rockhead of Scripture. And sometimes I think his brain was made of rock. Because he's sitting here not getting any of it. He's the one that opened up the keys to the church. And he's the one being called Satan. And a couple chapters over, we got Judas Iscariot. And we have painted him to be an enemy. He was the one that held the bag. He was money hungry. He was a zealot. He was somebody that just didn't get it. After three and a half years with Christ, how could he betray him? How could he become a traitor? How could he become the one for 30 pieces of silver? And we have demonized him. And we have made him out to be the bad guy in the story. And we would expect Jesus to say to him when he comes into the garden, Satan, get behind me. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus says, friend, why have you come? To the one that he's going to build his church on, he calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. And notice he wasn't talking to Satan there because Satan can't see through humans' perception either because Satan is not human. He's an angel created by God. So he was using the term Satan for Peter because Jesus understands something that we don't. He understands that anything that will hinder you from your destiny is not of God. And anything that does lead you to your destiny is of God. Simon Peter trying to hold up and come against the sufferings and the death of Jesus was hindering Jesus from his destiny. And so he said, Satan, get behind me. I don't want anything to do. My destiny is greater than my dilemma. But Judas, you're fulfilling my destiny. So come on and betray me. Be a traitor for me. I'm going to call you friend. Because if I allow you to turn me over to them, my death will set free all of those that love me. Well, Pastor, what does that have to do about Palm Sunday? I'll tell you what it has to do 
with Palm Sunday. Nobody, even Mary, who pondered these things in their heart, we don't see anybody standing up for Jesus after he's taken. Because he has shattered their reality. Until he rises again. And they see the risen Christ. And then after that, you have disciples that will die for him. Peter will no longer be wishy-washy. Peter understood. How do we know that he understood? Because he sat in a prison and just sang praises unto God. How do we know that Peter understood? It took him again some cajoling. In Acts chapter 10, God had to send the unclean screen down, if you will, the sheet, and said, Peter, I've dealt with you over and over and over again. Just trust me. Cornelius is clean. It gives us hope that somebody like Peter can be used so mightily, lets me know that I'm available. But here's the thing. You and I don't recognize when something is being a hindrance to our destiny or being a propeller to our destiny. Because the thing that will propel you will never seem fair to you. And the thing that seems like it would be fair to you is oftentimes the thing that will hinder you. And we don't like that. And so God has sent this preacher to you today to tell somebody that what you're going through may be a reality, but it is not your truth. The situation that seems to be dragging you down, that seems to cause you to suffer, that seems to cause you to hurt, is not hindering your destiny, but it's going to propel you into it. And because of that, if you get that perception your heart can say, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can I just tell you, that the Lord is trying to use this church and here's how I know I sense distraction. I sense distraction in individuals. I sense distraction in my own spirit. Trying to chase this rabbit over here and this rabbit over here so that we can get lost in the weeds. But Jesus has come today to say, that's not your reality. You just need to ignore that and keep pushing towards me. Somebody needs to look at their situation, as detrimental as it may be, and just say, friend, do what you're going to do. Because by the time you're done, I'm going to be walking in a new dimension with Jesus. Jesus. And there will be people that are walking it with me. I have long believed and long preached that we miss our destiny more often because we pray ourselves out of stuff than pray ourselves through stuff. Now, I know what the first argument is. Well, you just don't understand, Pastor, what I'm dealing with. It's just not fair. I know it's not fair. But God's not fair. He's not. Listen, read the book of Job. Is that fair? That God says, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Listen, let me just put it down to you in real crude terms. Jesus is not fair 
because he likes to gamble on truth. Have you considered my servant Job? Well, you've got a hedge around him. Okay, I'll take it away. Because I'm going to bet you, Satan, that he won't fall. And he won't succumb to your mess. Because I've seen in the side of his heart. And he'll, he may doubt me some, he may question, but he'll never give up. Okay, well, let me give a shot. He won't give a shot. And after a while, he comes back and says, well, how's that going with you, Satan? Well, you, uh, I've got, yeah, uh, yeah, you haven't let me touch his body. Okay, touch his body. At the very end of it. How's that going for you, Satan? Well, I couldn't get him. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give him back everything and double. I'm going to give him a greater wife, greater kids, greater resources, greater finances. I'm going to elevate him to a level that he's never dreamed of because I'm not fair and he lived for me anyhow. I'm going to elevate him. Can I just tell somebody that some of what you have gone through in your life may be God originated? I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble. And sometimes it's not our mess. Sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes I think God still may have conversations with our enemy and say, hey, listen, have you considered my servant Declan? Have you considered my servant Dennis? Have you considered? And then he takes his hands off of us, and it feels like God's a million miles away. That's not because he deserted you. It's because he trusted you to stand for him when the enemy comes against you. And when the enemy comes against you, if you'll just stand for him, the enemy will walk away whimpering, and all of a sudden God will step back on the scene and say, Here. You see, I believe that the church of today is not as powerful as the church of the first century. Not because we don't have the same word. Not because we don't have the same spirit. But we don't have the same perception. The perception in the book of Acts was, God will take care of it. You know, you read, I mentioned Paul and Silas in the dungeon. Okay, it wasn't a state penitentiary that had three meals a day. Yeah, it's not nice. I wouldn't want to be there. We know we have some people that are dealing with it right now, but but, but it's not that kind of a dungeon. Sitting amongst the rats and the muck and the feces, chained to a solid brick wall, No electricity, no heat, no cooling. Can you imagine the stench of that day? And yet when I read, I don't read Paul and Silas saying, well, it's just not fair. If Jesus really loved us, we would have never gone into this prison. I would have never had to deal with this jerk. What I read is at midnight, the darkest hour of the night, they sang praises unto him. It wasn't fair that they were there. It wasn't a nice setting. It wasn't a good place to be. But in the midst of their mass, they had a song in their heart. I don't know what they sang. Uh, uh, the Old Testament song that gets repeated oftentimes is, Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And as they're praising and singing in the atmosphere, that is not fair. A sweet-smelling savor of worship reaches into the heavens And God looks down and says, now you're getting it, Peter. Watch this. The walls begin to shake. 
the doors begin to rattle open. The chains that are on their hands and their feet begin to fall to the floor. And they begin to stand and walk out to the point where that jailer is getting ready to commit suicide because he thinks that there's been a jailbreak until Peter stops him and says, no, 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 we're all still here. Now listen to that. We're all still here. Peter didn't make a break for it. He didn't run away from the prison. In fact, he wasn't, he he wasn't going to go anywhere until they, they, they got done talking. And the Philippian jailer invited him back to his house. Some of you are looking at me like, well, what is it? What, what, what? Oh, somebody get this. In the midst of your unfairness, when you serve God, it will turn the heart of the one that has you in the unfair position, and you will become a light and an answer to that person's salvation. That's what Palm Sunday is all about, is triggering a truth that goes beyond reality. And the truth is this. Jesus is always in charge. We just don't like it. I'm coming to a close. But I need somebody to get this today and understand it. Why am I why am I dealing with this? Why is this family member being a jerk? Why is this situation at work not coming out? Why is this? Why is that? Why am I feeling down? Why am I feeling depressed? Could could you be feeling depressed because Jesus just wants to get you alone for a while? Don't get me wrong. Depression is a reality. It's very real. But it doesn't have to be a truth. Heartache is a reality. When you lay that loved one into the ground, it's a, there's a tearing of your heart and your spirit and a lack of comprehension and understanding. It's not fair that they suffered and died. That's the reality. That's the perception. But when you start looking through God's point of view, can I get, my heart is full today, so I'm trying to balance it all. But can I tell you, when my dad passed away, I realized I had one of two choices. I could become very, very angry at God. He was 62 years old. He was an Olympic athlete. Now, he didn't look it at 62. He had let himself go a little. But why? Why? God, you called me away from this area in 1988. I obediently went all the way to the East Coast. I spent five years in Delaware. Then you called me to Kansas City. I was there for 16 years. You finally call me back here to be around my family, and within two years we're getting a cancer diagnosis that it's inoperable. That ain't fair, God. God, I'm finally getting ready to be able to minister in the same area and do things with my dad that can help me minister, and he and I can develop a ministerial relationship that we haven't been able to do so far. God, I could even go golfing on Saturdays with him. Just not fair. Just not fair. Lord, you removed him from an area of, uh, of town that it sent the church into chaos. I don't get that. Family members that were trusting for your healing were troubled because you didn't heal. Struggled in their belief about who you are because you didn't heal him. Because Frank was Frank. He was indestructible. He got along with everybody, and everybody got along with him. 
and he ministered to all kinds of people all hours of the day. What in the world are you doing, God? That was what I could have done. But that same preacher that was laying in that casket on that day had taught me a lifelong lesson. God's in charge. And so I take a step back. And I begin to change my mentality. Because here's what I began to think. As much as I wanted my dad here, God wanted him more. And God's bigger than I am. And God's better than I am. Have I figured out all of the reasons why God? No, I probably never will. But I trust. I trust that what God does is right and good. My reality is I was losing my dad. My truth was I was gaining greater dad. Because I couldn't call my dad for advice, so I had to call my dad for advice. I couldn't lean on his wisdom, so I had to lean on his wisdom. I couldn't function in his anointing, so I had to function in his anointing. Hey, there was a few of you that were here. My dad preached my installation service as pastor of this church. And some of you will remember it. He threatened me over the pulpit in public. And he gave you that were here an initiative. He said it basically this way. Tim, if you don't love God and you don't love this people, I'm coming after you. That has echoed in my spirit for the last 15 years. And he's been gone for 10, 11. It still echoes from heaven. It's not fair. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But God, the truth is, you have elevated this church into an atmosphere of anointing that may not have been elevated if their pastor didn't have to go through that. A year later, not even quite a year, November of 2012, start working. My chest starts tightening up. I'm thinking it felt just like it did every fall when I started playing hockey. So I went to the doctors. Yeah, you've got a case of bronchitis. Let's put you on a Z-Pack. After three Z-Packs, nothing had changed. On December 3rd, my mom bought us tickets to go see the Christmas presentation that was happening at Excel. She had gotten us a suite for the whole family. And so we parked in the ramp, and I actually had to sit down two or three times on the way to the suite and two or three times back to the car. Chest just couldn't hardly breathe. I had been to the doctor, so my perceived reality was, got some bronchial stuff going on. That was a Sunday evening. I got up at 5.30 on Monday morning like I did every Monday morning. Put the black canvas pants and the black shirt on that represented Ameripride at the time. I got into the car, and as I'm in the car, I'm thinking, this is stupid. This is dumb. What am I doing? I'm going to go and try to work, and I can't hardly walk 20 paces. So I turn the car around. I go walk back in the house. I said, Trish, call Kim. Wake her up. She's got to come and stay with the boys. We're going to the hospital. Walk into the emergency room. I don't know how long we sat there. 
because when I was calm, it didn't hurt. Got back. Emergency doctor said, okay, let's do these tests. I passed them with flying colors. I was so good. He comes in. It's about 3 o'clock now in the afternoon. We don't have any answers. Maybe there's a pericardius or whatever, pericardium, whatever it is. It's pressurizing your heart, and that's what you're feeling. We'll deal with it this way. But you can, so we're going to set you up to go home, and then you come back for one more test. Or we can keep you overnight. And I look at Trish, and she looks at me, and before we can even say anything, the doctor stops us and says, no, forget that. We're doing it now. You're going to have to spend the night. I'm admitting you. We were stubborn enough. I probably would have gone home. Sends me to this test. Would have been Monday morning or Monday or Tuesday morning. I passed the test, but there is a microgram of difference of the fluid that fills the heart. Microgram. He said, probably won't even deal with it. He says, but because there is that slight microgram difference, we're going to do an angiogram. We're going to send a, a picture up there, and if, if there's something that needs to be fixed, great. If there's nothing that needs to be fixed, then the, we know that that's not what it is, and we'll try something different. That's why they call it medical practice. So I said, okay, let's do it. I had no fear. I've learned not to fear death. I don't think about it. But the Bible says, to every man is appointed a time to die. I don't know when that appointment is for me, so I might as well not worry about it and just live. So we're going back, and I don't know what's all going on in the waiting rooms. I know we called Gary, and Gary came up and called my, my sister was right on top of it. She was there in a heartbeat, and, and uh, so I'm laying on this ice-cold table, and I don't lay on my back very well anyhow, and all of a sudden on top is the screen, and I'm not totally out because I can watch where they're going, and about when the angiogram gets to about right about here, I said, am I supposed to be feeling this? You can feel that? We better get him some more. I said, oh, yeah, you're right about here. I pointed to my stomach. He said, that's exactly where we're at. <laughs> Goes up, finds out that my right coronary artery is 99% blocked. I felt so good after that surgery. They put the stent in. They pull the angiogram back out, and they put that big sand thing on to stop the bleeding, but it's not stopping and they forget that I'm still awake. And they let out a cuss word and said, I can't get it to stop bleeding. I said, I'm still awake. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. And so they go to the old-fashioned way, and it's a, almost like a Tupperware bowl. And they put you on, and then they strap you as tight and suction that, that wound or up so it... And so for three, four weeks, I missed work for like three or four weeks, not because of the surgery, but because of the repercussions. I was so bruised by that stupid thing that they had to put on me. You want to know what I thought while I was lying in the hospital bed? This is the stupidity of, of my understanding. But God, Saturday night's the concert. My wife wasn't happy. And what was worse, my sister was there. Here's what her words were, and if she ever watches this, this is what she said. Sanders, don't cancel. Sanders, don't cancel. I hate canceling things. So three days after that surgery... They propped me up on one of those red stools. This is while I was still singing with the group. And I sang the Christmas concert. Here's why I say that's powerful. Because if we would have canceled that, that year, 
we may have never gotten that ministry back because the year before we had to cancel because my dad was on his deathbed. Was it a good concert? Tell you what, it was an emotional one. I had a solo even. And I remember the praise team all weepy, teary-eyed because I made it through. Why did I say all that? Because I could have looked from my hospital bed and said, God, this isn't fair. I dealt with this last year. This church doesn't deserve a pastor that can't get up and preach. I did not preach that one Sunday. I had my brother-in-law come and preach. So I did miss that one Sunday. This church deserves somebody. This church, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve, I have given, I gave up my I gave up my house. I gave up my job. I gave up my income for you. How we do with God sometimes. And the Lord brought me to this scripture. And this is the scripture I want to close with today. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this... Everybody say all of this, all of the abuse, all of the hatred, all of the addiction, all of the shortcomings, all of the people treating you wrong, all of the breakdowns, all of the situations, all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving And God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Listen to this. This is it. This is the perception that those at Palm Sunday didn't get. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Listen, at some point in your walk with God, your troubles are small, but they will produce in you a glory that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I invite you to stand. Where is your perception level today? What are you perceiving today? Are you perceiving that things aren't fair? Woe is me. Or are you perceiving, if God has allowed me to make it this far, having dealt with all the junk I've dealt with, it means he's got a pretty good plan for me. Listen, my friend. We're coming up on Easter, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. I get all of that. I'm excited for all of that. But can I tell you, I am as excited for that as I am for him to release each one of us into a dimension of anointing that allows us to walk as he would have us to walk. Listen, I know it hurts. I know it hurts. I know it's troublesome. But listen... I don't mean to belittle your pain. But you're only dealing with your own junk. Jesus dealt with all of ours. (laughs) 
I speak Jesus into you today. Listen, you can't overcome your junk on your own. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there is a king that's riding on a colt into your life today. And when you cry out Hosanna to him, recognize that that Hosanna is not freeing you from all the junk, but it's propelling you into something that's greater than all the junk. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want to prolong this, but if you're here today and you have been tr struggling with the things of your situation and you're trying to figure it out, you're trying to overcome it, and, and you're in that atmosphere of, well, this isn't fair, God. Why am I dealing with all of this? Uh, would you just raise your hand across this congregation? Praise God. There's hands all over. And if your hand isn't raised now, it may be in a couple of days. But I want to pray over you. And we don't have time nor room to come around the altar, so I'm just asking you, would everybody just lay your hand on your own head? Jesus, by the authority of the Word of God and the power that's in the blood of the Lamb, I speak to every spirit here. I speak to every soul that's standing in your presence. Lord, they have laid their hands on their head in a, in a symbolism of a, of a release, in, symbol, in symbolism of a transfer, God, from your dimension to their dimension. I'm asking you to walk into every corner of their heart. I'm asking you, Lord, to look at every situation that to them seems to be unfair, and they have perceived it like Simon Peter perceived it. I'm asking you with grace and mercy, Lord Jesus, redirect their thought process. Lord, transform their thinking right now and allow them to recognize that the issues that they're dealing with are, are the propeller into a greater anointing and understanding of who you are. God, I'm asking you right now from the top of their head to the sole of their feet to release mercy and grace and truth into their spirit. Lord, I come against the voice of the enemy who doesn't have a word of truth in him. I silence him by the authority of your word and the power in your blood. And I plead the blood of the Lamb over this congregation right now. Lord, from the very top to the very bottom, saturate and consume us with the anointing of your blood, Lord. And now begin to transition us, Lord, from our stuff into our story. And let this day be a mark of when our walk changes with you. Where we stop walking in the trudgery of the things that seem to hinder us. And we start walking in the authority of the name that you have given us. I am who I am because I am who you said I am. I am who I am because of who you said I am. I am blood-bought. Ah, I am spirit-filled. I am Holy Ghost justified and sanctified. I am pure and righteous in your eyes because your blood has been shed abroad in my spirit. And now, Lord, the things that have held us bound. In just a moment, as we raise our voices in praise, like Paul and Silas, I'm asking you to shake every wall, shake every door, and shake every chain, and let them fall and rattle from their hinges so that the person that has been keeping us in that dungeon will recognize that something bigger than we are has stepped on the scene and we can take it to their house and their whole house can find you. And so Jesus, now we raise our hands in worship and in praise. Lift up your voice, my friend, in worship and praise and let the chains begin to fall and the walls begin to shake. And the doors begin to rattle. 
Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. I sense a shaking going on right now. I hear some chains beginning to rattle right now. Ha! Your reality is getting ready to change into truth. Your reality is getting ready to transform into truth. Yes, 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 yes. Ah, ah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. My God. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. I have a challenge for somebody this week. That challenge is simply this. As you walk in Christ this week, God is wanting to give you a victory like never before. And I want to give you a very practical way to do so. I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again because we've got so many new people. The Bible says that the enemy is the prince and the power of the air. But there's something that happens when we begin to shout. Scientifically, when you begin to shout... There is something that tears at the air that's around you. It's the reason why he doesn't want you to shout. Because when you begin to shout, you begin to shred his territory. So if you're dealing with things, I want to challenge you this week. Walk into a room, all the rooms of your house. Maybe do it when the kids aren't there or something. But, or bring the kids along, let them shout as well. And just begin to shout. If you don't know what to say... There's four words that will get you a long ways. I love you, Jesus. And if you want to add a fifth, it's the word hallelujah. It's the universal word that says, here I am. It's everything. And you begin to shout that in your home. If you have it at work, you begin to walk through the office. I wouldn't suggest shouting. You might scare somebody. But as you begin to speak over those areas, you are shredding the territory of the enemy. And just see what God does. Just see what God does. do Do you sense the wave the pulsating of the presence of God that's in this house. I, I just have a feeling that we're kind of like Mount St. Helen right now. There's some pre-tremors. But God's getting ready just to... In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I just wanted to share something in my spirit. Uh, The pastor, the Lord had told him that uh, he felt that uh, the Holy Spirit was saying that there's a worship on the inside of someone and that we're trying to control it in. God has given me this this praise. I'm a radical in my praise, and sometimes it gets scary when I go in new places because I don't want to be looked at or feel kind of weird and whatnot. But it's it's like you know th- this praise in the bone. You just can't shut it up. You got to let it out. But but there's a scripture in the Bible that that always draws me to uh, encourages me to go forward. I think what God is saying through you, Pastor, is that He wants. There's people in here who has a fear on the inside that don't want to let go. But when you let go, there's a breakthrough. When you let go, there's a, a transformation that happens when you just let go and lose yourself. So David, I'm going to read this one scripture in the book of first, Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 21. And David, and so we got my cow being, um, she, she, she's like, David, why are you dancing like this in front of the, the king's maid service? And, and this was David's response to her in verse 21. David said to my cow, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and gave all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel and the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. Now check this out. He said, I will make myself yet more content than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. So what God is saying is we have to lose ourselves. Humble, if you humble yourself, hallelujah, that God will begin to exalt you. If you, ex- if you humble yourself in praise and, and undignify yourself and unclothe your own glory before God, then God's glory will begin to shower upon you and things will break through that you want in your life. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, let there be a breaking. Let there be a breaking, let there be a breaking, let there be a breaking. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is so correct, and your radical praise fits right with us. In fact, how many remember about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, Trisha said, there are going to be somebody run the aisles. Two weeks ago, he comes flying by. I didn't quite get my high five out of him, though, but he came flying by. Listen, worship opens up the heavens. Now, listen, I'm asking before we go, I'm asking a favor of the people that are in this house right now. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. It's one of the two Sundays of the year that there are some people that show up for church. They're called CE Christians, Christmas and Easter. I don't want to criticize them. At the same time, when they walk into this house, I want them to experience something that they cannot deny. Which means this, we have to have this atmosphere at 1030. We can't wrap at 930. Randy's looking for some help. Randy's speaking at 930. But we can't afford to come in here with our distractions and have to ramp up our worship. We've got to walk in here on fire, ready to go. So that means on Friday night at, at, at Friday, Good Friday service and on Saturday, we've got to get our spirits, our minds, and our voices ready so that when we walk in here, from the first sound, from the first sound of Sunday school to the last sound of the services, God is just exploding. Always remember this. He always fills the house before he fills the people. So come and let's have this house filled right from the get-go. We're not dismissing. We're not even to have a closing prayer. Just have a great week and walk in the resurrection power and the perception and the truth of who you are in Jesus.